I had just finished my tea when he returned, evidently in excellent spirits, swinging an old elastic-sided boot in his hand. He chucked it down into a corner and helped himself to a cup of tea. I only looked in as I passed, said he. I am going right on. Where to? Oh, to the other side of the West End. It may be some time before I get back. Don't wait up for me in case I should be late. How are you getting on? Oh, so-so. Nothing to complain of. I have been out to Streatham since I saw you last, but I did not call at the house. It is a very sweet little problem, and I would not have missed it for a good deal. However, I must not sit gossiping here, but must get these disreputable clothes off and return to my highly respectable self. I could see by his manner that he had stronger reasons for satisfaction than his words alone would imply. His eyes twinkled, and there was even a touch of colour upon his sallow cheeks. He hastened upstairs, and a few minutes later I heard the slam of the hall door, which told me that he was off once more upon his congenial hunt. I waited until midnight, but there was no sign of his return, so I retired to my room. It was no uncommon thing for him to be away for days and nights on end when he was hot upon a scent, so that his lateness caused me no surprise. I do not know at what hour he came in, but when I came down to breakfast in the morning, there he was with a cup of coffee in one hand and the paper in the other, as fresh and trim as possible. You will excuse my beginning without you, Watson, said he, but you remember that our client has rather an early appointment this morning. Why, it is after nine now, I answered. I should not be surprised if that were he. I thought I heard a ring. It was indeed our friend the financier. I was shocked by the change which had come over him, for his face, which was naturally of a broad and massive mould, was now pinched and fallen in, while his hair seemed to me at least a shade whiter. He entered with a weariness and lethargy which was even more painful than his violence of the morning before, and he dropped heavily into the armchair which I pushed forward for him. I do not know what I have done to be so severely tried, said he. Only two days ago I was a happy and prosperous man, without a care in the world. Now I am left to a lonely and dishonoured age. One sorrow comes close upon the heels of another. My niece, Mary, has deserted me. Deserted you? Yes. Her bed this morning had not been slept in. Her room was empty, and a note for me lay upon the hall table. I had said to her last night, in sorrow and not in anger, that if she had married my boy, all might have been well with him. Perhaps it was thoughtless of me to say so. It is to that remark that she refers in this note. My dearest uncle, I feel that I have brought trouble upon you, and that if I had acted differently, this terrible misfortune might never have occurred. I cannot, with this thought in my mind, ever again be happy under your roof, and I feel that I must leave you for ever. Do not worry about my future, for that is provided for. And above all, do not search for me, for it will be fruitless labour and an ill service to me. In life or in death, I am ever your loving Mary. What could she mean by that note, Mr. Holmes? Do you think it points to suicide? No, no, nothing of the kind. It is perhaps the best possible solution. I trust, Mr. Holder, that you are nearing the end of your troubles. Ha! Huh. You say so. You've heard something, Mr. Holmes. You've learned something. Where are the gems? You would not think a thousand pounds apiece an excessive sum for them? I would pay ten. That would be unnecessary. Three thousand will cover the matter. There's a little reward, I fancy. Have you your checkbook? Here's a pen. Better make it out for four thousand pounds. With a dazed face, the banker made out the required check. Holmes walked over to his desk, took out a little triangular piece of gold with three gems in it, and threw it down upon the table. With a shriek of joy, a client clutched it up. You have it, he gasped. I'm saved! I'm saved! The reaction of joy was as passionate as his grief had been, and he hugged his recovered gems to his bosom. There is one other thing you owe, Mr. Holder, said Sherlock Holmes rather sternly. Oh, he caught up a pen. Name the sum, and I will pay it. No, the debt is not to me. You owe a very humble apology to that noble lad, your son, who has carried himself in this matter, as I should be proud to see my own son do, should I ever chance to have one. Then it was not Arthur who took them? 
I told you yesterday, and I repeat today, that it was not. You're sure of it? Then let us hurry to him at once to let him know that the truth is known. He knows it already. When I had cleared it all up, I had an interview with him, and finding that he would not tell me the story, I told it to him, on which he had to confess that I was right, and to add the very few details which were not yet quite clear to me. Your news of this morning, however, may open his lips. For heaven's sake, tell me, then, what is this extraordinary mystery? I will do so, and I will show you the steps by which I reached it. And let me say to you first, that which it is hardest for me to say and for you to hear. There has been an understanding between Sir George Burnwell and your niece, Mary. They have now fled together. My Mary? Impossible! It is, unfortunately, more than possible. It is certain. Neither you nor your son knew the true character of this man when you admitted him into your family circle. He is one of the most dangerous men in England, a ruined gambler, an absolutely desperate villain, a man without heart or conscience. Your niece knew nothing of such men when he breathed his vows to her, as he had done to a hundred before her. She flattered herself that she alone had touched his heart. The devil knows best what he said. But at least she became his tool and was in the habit of seeing him nearly every evening. I cannot, and I will not believe it, cried the banker with an ashen face. I will tell you, then, what occurred in your house last night. Your niece, when you had, as she thought, gone to your room, slipped down and talked to her lover through the window which leads into the stable lane. His footmarks had pressed right through the snow, so long had he stood there. She told him of the coronet, his wicked lust for gold kindled at the news, and he bent her to his will. I have no doubt that she loved you, but there are women in whom the love of a lover extinguishes all other loves, and I think that she must have been one. She had hardly listened to his instructions when she saw you coming downstairs, on which she closed the window rapidly, and told you about one of the servants' escapade with her wooden-legged lover, which was all perfectly true. Your boy, Arthur, went to bed after his interview with you, but he slept badly on account of his uneasiness about his club debts. In the middle of the night he heard a soft tread pass his door, so he rose, and, looking out, was surprised to see his cousin walking very stealthily along the passage until she disappeared into your dressing room. Petrified with astonishment, the lad slipped on some clothes and waited there in the dark to see what would come of this strange affair. Presently she emerged from the room again, and in the light of the passage lamp your son saw that she carried the precious coronet in her hands. She passed down the stairs, and he, thrilling with horror, ran along and slipped behind the curtain near your door, whence he could see what passed in the hall beneath. He saw her stealthily open the window, hand out the coronet to someone in the gloom, and then, closing it once more, hurry back to her room, passing quite close to where he stood hid behind the curtain. As long as she was on the scene, he could not take any action without a horrible exposure of the woman whom he loved. But the instant that she was gone, he realized how crushing a misfortune this would be for you, and how all-important it was to set it right. He rushed down, just as he was, in his bare feet, opened the window, sprang out into the snow, and ran down the lane where he could see a dark figure in the moonlight. Sir George Burnwell tried to get away, but Arthur caught him, and there was a struggle between them. Your lad, tugging at one side of the coronet, and his opponent at the other. In the scuffle, your son struck Sir George and cut him over the eye. Then something suddenly snapped, and your son, finding that he had the coronet in his hands, rushed back, closed the window, ascended to your room, and had just observed the coronet had been twisted in the struggle, and was endeavouring to straighten it when you appeared upon the scene. Is it possible? gasped the banker. You then roused his anger by calling him names at a moment when he felt that he had deserved your warmest thanks. He could not explain the true state of affairs without betraying one who certainly deserved little enough consideration at his hands. He took the more chivalrous view, however, and preserved her secret. And that was why she shrieked and fainted when she saw the coronet, cried Mr. Holder. Oh, my God! What a blind fool I have been! And his asking to be allowed to go out for five minutes! 
The dear fellow wanted to see if the missing piece were at the scene of the struggle. How cruelly I have misjudged him. When I arrived at the house, continued Holmes, I at once went very carefully round it to observe if there were any traces in the snow which might help me. I knew that none had fallen since the evening before, and also that there had been a strong frost to preserve impressions. I passed along the tradesman's path, but found it all trampled down and indistinguishable. Just beyond it, however, at the far side of the kitchen door, a woman had stood and talked with a man, whose round impressions on one side showed that he had a wooden leg. I could even tell that they had been disturbed, for the woman had run back swiftly to the door, as was shown by the deep toe and light heel marks, while wooden leg had waited a little and then had gone away. I thought at the time that this might be the maid and her sweetheart, of whom you had already spoken to me, and inquiry showed it was so. I passed round the garden without seeing anything more than random tracks, which I took to be the police, but when I got into the stable lane, a very long and complex story was written in the snow in front of me. There was a double line of tracks of a booted man, and a second double line which I saw with delight belonged to a man with naked feet. I was at once convinced from what you had told me that the latter was your son. The first had walked both ways, but the other had run swiftly and as his tread was marked in places over the depression of the boot, it was obvious that he had passed after the other. I followed them up and found they led to the hall window, where Boots had worn all the snow away while waiting. Then I walked to the other end, which was a hundred yards or more down the lane. I saw where Boots had faced round, where the snow was cut up as though there had been a struggle, and finally where a few drops of blood had fallen, to show me that I was not mistaken. Boots had then run down the lane, and another little smudge of blood showed that it was he who had been hurt. When he came to the high road at the other end, I found that the pavement had been cleared, so there was an end to that clue. On entering the house, however, I examined, as you remember, the sill and framework of the hall window with my lens, and I could at once see that someone had passed out. I could distinguish the outline of an instep where the wet foot had been placed in coming in. I was then beginning to be able to form an opinion as to what had occurred. A man had waited outside the window, someone had brought the gems, the deed had been overseen by your son, he had pursued the thief, had struggled with him, they had each tugged at the coronet, their united strength causing injuries which neither alone could have effected. He had returned with the prize but had left a fragment in the grasp of his opponent. So far I was clear. The question now was, who was the man? and who was it brought him the coronet? It is an old maxim of mine that when you have excluded the impossible, whatever remains, however improbable, must be the truth. Now I knew that it was not you who had brought it down, so there only remained your niece and the maids. But if it were the maids, why should your son allow himself to be accused in their place? There could be no possible reason. As he loved his cousin, however, there was an excellent explanation of why he should retain her secret, the more so as the secret was a disgraceful one. When I remembered that you had seen her at that window, and how she had fainted on seeing the coronet again, my conjecture became a certainty. And who could it be who was her confederate? A lover, evidently, for who else could outweigh the love and gratitude which she must feel to you? I knew that you went out little, and that your circle of friends was a very limited one but among them was Sir George Burnwell. I had heard of him before as being a man of evil reputation among women. It must have been he who wore those boots and retained the missing gems. Even though he knew that Arthur had discovered him, he might still flatter himself that he was safe, for the lad could not say a word without compromising his own family. Well, your own good sense will suggest what measures I took next. I went in the shape of a loafer to Sir George's house, managed to pick up an acquaintance with his valet, learned that his master had cut his head the night before, and, finally, at the expense of six shillings, made all sure by buying a pair of his cast-off shoes. With these I journeyed down to Streatham and saw that they exactly fitted the tracks. "'I saw an ill-dressed vagabond in the lane yesterday evening,' said Mr. Holder. "'Precisely. It was I. I found that I had my man, so I came home and changed my clothes.' It was a delicate part which I had to play then, for I saw that a prosecution must be avoided to avert scandal, and I knew that so astute a villain would see that our hands were tied in the matter. I went and saw him. At first, of course, he denied everything, but when I gave him every particular that had occurred, 
He tried to bluster and took down a life preserver from the wall. I knew my man, however, and I clapped a pistol to his head before he could strike. Then he became a little more reasonable. I told him that we would give him a price for the stones he held, one thousand pounds apiece. That brought out the first signs of grief that he had shown. Why, dash it all, said he, I've let them go at six hundred for the three. I soon managed to get the address of the receiver who had them, on promising him that there would be no prosecution. Off I set to him, and after much chaffering, I got our stones at one thousand pounds apiece. Then I looked in upon your son, told him that all was right, and eventually got to my bed about two o'clock, after what I may call a really hard day's work. A day which has saved England from a great public scandal, said the banker, rising. Sir, I cannot find words to thank you, but you shall not find me ungrateful for what you have done. Your skill has indeed exceeded all that I have heard of it. And now I must fly to my dear boy, to apologize to him for the wrong which I have done him. As to what you tell me of poor Mary, it goes to my very heart. Not even your skill can inform me where she is now. I think that we may safely say, returned Holmes, that she is wherever Sir George Burnwell is. It is equally certain, too, that whatever her sins are, they will soon receive a more than sufficient punishment. <laughs>